what we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Hello and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History. This is Chapter 17, Nomadic Empires and Eurasian Integration. First up, nomadic herders populated the steppes of Asia for centuries during the classical and post-classical eras, and periodically came into contact and conflict with the established states and empires of the Eurasian landmass. It was not until the 11th century, however, that the nomadic peoples like the Turks and Mongols began to raid, conquer, rule, and trade with the urban-based cultures in a systemic and far-reaching manner. While these resourceful and warlike nomads often left a path of destruction in their wake, they also built fast trans-regional empires that laid the foundations for the increasing communication and exchange that would characterize the period from 1000 to 1500 in the Eastern Hemisphere. The success of these nomadic empires in this era can be attributed to the following. Number 1. They had unmatched skill on horseback. When organized on a large scale, these nomads were practically indomitable in warfare. Outstanding cavalry forces, skilled archers, and well-coordinated military strategy gave these people an advantage that was difficult for even the most powerful states to counter. Number two, they had the ability to integrate vast territories through secure trade routes, exceptional courier networks, diplomatic missions, missionary efforts, and resettlement programs. In spite of these successes and the enormous influence of these nomadic peoples, their leaders were, in general, better at warfare than administration. With the exception of the later Ottoman Empire, most of these states were relatively short-lived brought down by both internal and external pressures. All right, so first up we have rainfall in the Central Asia is too little to support large-scale agriculture. One of the things that we need to talk about really early on is this nomadic economy that sprouts up in the Central Asian region. The other empires and the other societies that we've studied in the past pretty much do not get their start until the invention of agriculture early on in, in their civilization. This leads to calorie surpluses, which leads to large-scale um, population growth, and then we get to a point where they're able to have enough food surplus that allows them to differentiate their skills and their crafts to being other than just farming and farmers. They develop religion, they develop administrative structures, they develop uh, craftsmen and artisans and tradesmen, and those are people who are able to make the empire what it is in terms of building uh, large-scale uh, architecture, building um, war-like uh, parts to their empire so they can build large armies, they can have other arts and leisure activities integrated into all of that, they can also start to set up larger trade networks and be part of a, mer a merchant class will evolve from that process. The problem, however, with this uh, area of the globe is there is not enough rain to support this large-scale agriculture, which allows for that development of the classical civilization structure that we've talked about in chapters past. This leads the nomadic economy and society to be mostly animal herding. Now, animal herding can be lucrative, but it is very difficult. Many times in uh, this type of structure for societies, you're not really stationary in one place. You have to actually move, thus the nomadic part. You have animal herding, which relies on the grazing of either cattle or sheep or goats or herd animals to move around large plain areas where low-lying grass is easily accessible to those herd animals. And from there, you're able to allow these animals to fatten up. And when they reach certain ages or when you move them to a market uh, area, you're able to basically kill them or use them for whatever purposes. Like for the example of sheep, you're using them for wool. So this animal herding, for these groups is really about number one food you're able to get a lot of meat a lot of protein as a result of this process and this food is something that um, is able to sustain you in spite of the lack of agriculture so these diets for these people are going to be mostly protein and meat based less based on um, grains and carbs so they will be foraging and uh, looking for other types of supplemental um, greens and some and herbs and other things that grow naturally on the plains but mostly they're using this animal herding for their food they then also use them for clothing not only will sheep's wool for example be something that is prized amongst the nomadic herding societies but also uh, hides from horses cows other animals uh, that they are really grazing with and herding at this time and eventually they use those um, hides to make shelter, which are called yurts in this uh, region of the globe. And these shelters are just pretty much really fancy tents. I'll have a picture on the next slide. But basically, uh, they're able to be put up very quickly. They're able to be put up anywhere, really. They provide warmth. They have a hole in the top for their fire. 
And these migratory patterns, uh, you basically follow the pasture land, as I talked about before, with um, the low-lying grasslands. And they also developed some small-scale farming when uh, it was feasible and some rudimentary or basic artisanry. So they do have some weapons. They do have some small-scale uh, metal craft. They have some uh, not really well-developed farming, but they are still pretty much following these herds. And it just depended on what the what that group basically needed at the time. If there's one thing we need to know going forward, this chapter is going to be kind of different than all other chapters. Most civilizations we've studied so far kind of follow a pretty normal pattern of agriculture, culture development, architecture, religion, uh, administration, yada, yada, yada. This group, however, these uh, nomadic societies in the Central Asian Plains are basically going to have more of an opposite effect to most of the things that we've talked about. So if you've kind of developed a habit of looking at these groups uh, as being kind of uniform and everybody's kind of doing the same thing, you're going to kind of be surprised by some of the things that we talk about here. Next, we have uh, nomads in Turkmenistan here in this uh, picture. There's a yurt, and there's a horse, and there's some sheep, and you see the people there. They're pretty much just uh, tending their flocks. Next, we have the nomadic economy. Trade links between nomadic and settled peoples. The trade links between these nomadic peoples was important and influential because basically that Central Asian plain is kind of the largest part of the Silk Road network during this time. This trade link allowed for those nomads to meet with traders on the way. It allowed for them to do grazing and provide protein or meat for those settlements that were uh, not really uh, focused so much on the herding aspects for their culture. And this trade link allowed the nomadic peoples to carve out an existence in this Central Asian plain. And uh, the nomads are also really equipped through this process to engage in long distance travel. Since the nomads are already following their flocks, they're already following their herds, they're the ones that are going out and making sure that um, they're able to have long distance travel goods with them, but they're also going to be able to follow them very far with the use of horses. They can engage in long distance travel because they just need to follow those herds around. These caravan routes also run through their territory. As the caravans run through, it could be uh, useful to stop those caravans for trade or raiding as necessary during this time. And so this creates a, a small scale economy for this nomadic uh, group. Nomadic society. Governance is basically clan based. Uh, in the past, we talked about cultures and civilizations as being able to break bonds of kin groups, breaking bonds of tribes. But in the nomadic society, basically this clan mentality kind of seeds its way into most of these um, peoples because what ends up happening is the you aren't able to establish larger interactions with a community or a culture outside of the people you're pretty much born into and live with. You might interact with other clans at um, gatherings, you might interact with other clans at different events or different types of training uh, sessions, but mostly you're pretty much by yourself with your family during this time. And um, through this, charismatic individuals become nobles and occasionally they'll assert authority. And you usually, unusually fluid status for nobility. Here's what ends up happening. They, the way it works traditionally in these cultures is that long, long ago, somebody asserted power in the culture, in these classical cultures that we talked about. And they establish a hereditary lineage for their group and barring war, disease, or overthrow from invasion, you pretty much have this nobility class that's established. Think India, think Greece, Rome, all the great classical civilizations that we've talked about in the past. The difference, however, for these nomadic societies is that this nobility class can rise or fall uh, basically through incompetence. If you were a good leader, you could rise through the ranks and you could lead the people and you could protect the people and your kids could assert the throne or the, the mantle of leadership right after, but through uh, their incompetence, you could actually lose the, your nobility status for your clan or your family. Uh, there was advancement for emeritus non-nobles. If you were a uh, non-noble in this uh, group, you could advance up the social strata and make yourself a name for your clan, for yourself, for your family. Um, through this process and it was really based on your your value to your community or your group during this time a very skilled warrior a very skilled warrior group uh, from a certain family a very strong general uh, really good herders uh, etc good traders those are people who could rise while those who were pretty much incompetent at the very important and necessary parts to being a nomadic society would fall through the social strata 
Next, we have gender relations. This is one of those rare occasions where women wielded considerable influence. Uh, traditionally, we talked about in those other cl classical cultures that women pretty much were relegated to either non uh, non human status, they were somewhere between animals and men, or they were basically a subcast of human in a lot of those cultures. But within the nomadic societies, because there isn't this agricultural divide, there isn't a uh, demand for higher levels of labor, women were seen as um, advisors, and if occasionally they even made it as high as regents or rulers. A regent is someone who's over a smaller group than a ruler would be over a whole group and a whole culture. These women, women will do considerable influence because they were seen as uh, equally valuable to the herding process. They needed to set up tents, they needed to help to herd animals, to uh, take care of children, to take care of horses, to collect water, do all the things that everyone else had to do. And because agriculture wasn't something that was uh, a big part of going out in the hot sun in the fields and, and planting, these women could basically be seen as almost equals during this time. Nomadic religion. Shamans were the center of pagan worship. Shamans are basically uh, like witch doctors or people who appeal to the spirits of the sky, the land, the rocks, the trees, the whatever the spirits may be out in the world. They would get their cues by um, divining, basically using different kinds of methods. Like, for example, a very classic um, divining structure would be uh, tea leaf reading. Drink tea, the leaves as they form at the very bottom of the last, right before you take the last sip, you swirl around a certain time. You say a certain amount of words over it, and then the diviner or the shaman would read the tea leaves and tell you what uh, the gods hold in your future. This isn't necessarily as a part of the nomadic religion, but these shamans would have done similar types of um, divining through this process. There is an appeal of Buddhism and Nestorian Christianity. Nestorian Christianity focuses heavily on um, like the mystical side of Jesus. It focuses on um, the spiritualism in Christianity, less on the ritual, rituals and structure of the traditional Catholic Church that we talked about developing in Rome during this time. Islam has an appeal, um, and Achaeanism, which we talked about that duality of light and dark from the 6th century CE, they all have an appeal because, again, these nomads are interacting with different groups. They're finding what they like. As these groups interact with one group or another, they adopt some of those religious practices as uh, part of their normal training uh, of not only goods but culture. Turkish script is developed partially to record religious teachings, uh, partially to record religious teachings, and as always to record goods being traded. This uh, Turkish script is uh, what survives long term to not necessarily modern day Turkey, but it ends up being started during this time. Conversion to Islam in the 10th century due to Abbasid influence when the Abbasids are um, in that area during this time. The military organization. It, there were large confederations under a con. Now, a confederation is basically a large group with smaller groups as a part of it that can choose to participate or not participate in defense of the country or defense of the region or participate in trade networks. Confederations basically live and die based on the willingness of the group to find a way to work together. The good appeal, large scale appeal of confederations is if you don't really want to do anything or you don't want to attack people, you don't really have to. And if you don't really want to trade with people, you don't really have to. But you can work together and create peaceful relations and get support when those uh, things are necessary as a result of natural interactions with other cultures. The authority is extended through tribal leaders. So the Khan would have been the uh, large ruler over the many uh, smaller clan groups. And then through the Khan, uh, orders or dictates or trade uh, agreements would be arranged and then the tribal leaders or tribal elders for each smaller clan group would either listen to the Khan or not listen to the Khan and if you listen to the Khan you were rewarded if you were not going to listen to Khan you were punished but this confederation really uh, finds a way to provide a lot of structure and support to a very unstructured society exceptionally strong cavalries uh, they had mobility and speed. One of the biggest uh, advantages to this uh, step diplomacy, this step um, interaction between the nomadic peoples and others was the ability to have cavalries. They were skilled horsemen. They'd spent most of their lives on horseback herding and uh, watching over their flocks. And through this, they were able to basically learn how to ride very fast, very efficiently on their horses. It allowed for mobility where they could move groups um, very quickly across terrain, the the steppe area of the Central Asian Plain is kind of 
strange it has lots of plateaus it has steep embankments you kind of need to know the land you need to know where the water runs the where it all flows and this mobility allowed them to be able to go places where other armies couldn't where other armies didn't really uh shift or change very efficiently they also provided lots of speed they could do raids they could do almost like guerrilla warfare where they hit and ran. They could do what's called a feint in warfare, which is where you attack, then pretend to be retreating, forcing uh, the opposing army to break their ranks and pretty much do a, a unbalanced or unstructured charge at your retreating troops. Then you could turn your horses around or your men around and slaughter them as they were all out of position and out of columns and strength. Many of the classical civilizations we studied had many defensive techniques such as the phalanx and the roman um like guards where they would line their shields next up to each other and kind of have like a rotational structure to be able to fight large armies very efficiently without losing many men uh this breaking of those things like phalanx with other civilizations when these feints would take place would cause chaos and basically the the underpowered and under uh manned Khan uh, groups, uh, Mongol groups, would be able to uh, take over uh, larger armies through this process. Here is the Turkish empires and their neighbors. We have the Byzantine Emperor up, Empire up there in the brown, right around Constantinople. We have the Sultanate of Rum, which is in red. It's pretty much most of Turkey in modern day Turkey, Anatolia then. The Abbasid Empire we can see stretching out in the green. We have the area under the Abbasid control under the Saljuk, con excuse me, area of Abbasid Empire under Salju control in the hashed uh, white and green. We also have the Sultanate of Delhi over in northern India. Uh, we have some contested areas right around the Hindu Kush ranges between where Persia meets India. And this is around 1210 CE. So next we're going to talk about two um, real groups. We have the Saljuk Turks and the Abbasid Empire. In the 8th to 10th centuries, the Turkish people on the border of the Af Abbasid Empire, as we talked about, they are service to the Abbasid armies. Um, eventually come to dominate the Abbasid Caliphs. In 1055, the Saljuk leader Turghil Beg is recognized as Sultan. Through Turghil, he consolidates his hold on Baghdad, which is in modern-day Iraq, then extends the rule to other parts of the empire. And the Abbasid Caliphs serve as a figurehead of authority. This is one of those times where you should start to kind of notice a pattern developing when a stronger smaller group is able to pretty much exert its influence through military means we have one of those things that we need to know about for our essays that we're going to be starting to look at here going forward uh called change and continuity over time and compare and contrast this is one of those instances of compare and contrast where the basset caliph serves the figureheads of authority that term figureheads of authority starts to pop up more and more and more in heavily militarized societies we're going to talk about that a little later when we talk about um imperial japan and some of the other um south east southwestern asian cultures going forward the Saljuk Turks and the Byzantine Empire. By 1071, the Saljuk Turks defeat the Byzantine army at Manzikert, and they take their emperor captive. There's a large-scale invasion of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. There are many conversions to Islam. The Ottoman Turks conquer Constantinople in 1453. So, uh, basically, the last remaining center for what we would consider Rome, as those in Constantinople would, in the Byzantine Empire would have seen themselves as uh, Romans, are taken over by the Ottoman Turks, basically turning most of that area into an Islamic region. Next, we get Ghazavanid, Turks, and the Sultanate of Delhi. Mahmud of Ghazini is from Afghanistan. He invades northern India. We talked about him a little bit for before. First, he plunders, then he rules. Northern India is completely dominated by the 13th century, and as a result of this expansion of Islam, there's a persecution of Buddhism and Hindus. And we're going to get a little bit back to the Central Asian Plain by talking about Chinggis Khan and the making of the Mongol Empire. Originally born Timujin uh, in 1167, his father was a prominent warrior and was poisoned by the other uh, leaders within his group around 1177, and uh, Timujin and his mother were forced into poverty. He eventually will master what's known as step diplomacy and elimination of enemies. He knew how to play uh, different clan groups off of one another. He learned how to consolidate confederations around his leadership. He learned to play uh, the house of cards of politics for the Mongols. He learned the ability to know who to trust, who not to trust, who was going to be a threat in the future, who was not going to be a threat in the future. His uh, wisdom and ruthlessness as a leader is something that is never again uh, really 
rivaled in the Mongol uh, structure. He brought all Mongol tribes into one confederation, which had never been done before, and by 1206, he is proclaimed Chinggis Khan, or the universal ruler. If you look up him in, say, the internet, in the past we had called him Genghis Khan, with a G, but uh, most modern scholars call him Chinggis Khan as a more appropriate uh, translation of his name. There is a Mongol political organization. It broke up tribal organization. So originally when we talked about these nomadic peoples, we talked about um, earlier that they weren't really Mongols, they were just nomads. And as they interacted with one another, they basically stuck together as clans. Now, Chinggis Khan's great idea was to break up the tribal organization by forming military units from men of different tribes. What he would do is collect young men and young uh, soldiers from different groups, from the different tribes and assemble them into new units that were forced to work alongside each other. These men were forced to learn to protect one each one another and not be loyal necessarily to their clan anymore, but to their fighting group. Uh, promoted officials on the basis of merit and loyalty. Genghis Khan did not promote originally based on the nobility scheme of heredity, but based on the basis of merit and loyalty, meaning the more loyal you were and the more um, efficient you were at your job, uh, you were going to rise to the ranks of the Mongol leadership more so than those who had been originally within a tribe. It becomes very difficult to follow a leader if all you ever feel is that there is a constant scent of nepotism, meaning a uh, promotion from within your group or within your family. And as someone who was learning to con uh, consolidate a confederation around himself, Chinggis Khan learned that allowing uh, officials to move from different tribes up through the ranks in his organization of government uh, through their loyalty really allowed him a larger uh, sphere of influence over the greater Khan uh, structure. He established his capital at Karakum. Uh, the Mongol arms. Mongol population is only around 1 million. That's less than 1% of the Chinese population. And its army only numbered 100,000 to about 125,000. Its strengths again was the cavalry, that ability to ride horseback, they had short bows. Short bows uh, can be fired quickly. They don't need a lot of um, pullback to fire very far. You're basically riding right up on someone and firing that short bow right as close as you can to them to fire that uh, weapon into your chest. If you miss, you just pull out another uh, arrow, fire again. When you run out of arrows, you run away. Uh, the Mongols also did something that many uh, successful cultures in the past had done. They rewarded the enemies who surrendered and cruel to enemies who fought. If you were an enemy who was going to be fighting the Mongols, if you surrendered, you would be welcomed in, you would pay your tribute, you would continue to be a culture, and you would just make sure that you recognize the Mongols as your leaders. But if you fought back, they were harsh and oppressive to those people who uh, really tried to resist Mongol influence. Mongol conquests. There's a conquest of China by 1220. There's a conquest of Afghanistan and Persia. Emissaries were murdered. The following year, Chinggis Khan destroyed the ruler. Uh, there's a great documentary called Barbarians, the Mongols. You can watch it. Emissaries were sent to uh, different uh, regions of the area. A famous story goes that uh, Chinggis Khan sent out an emissary. When he arrived at the town, the emissary was uh, beaten, shaved, and sent out. Chinggis thought this was just a mistake, so he sent out another emissary. Those emissaries were murdered. The following year, Chinggis Khan destroyed uh, basically that entire town and that region. He did so much destruction that if you go to those areas to this day, there are large-scale ruins of people basically just abandoning those settlements. He poisoned wells. He destroyed agriculture. He destroyed all life pretty much around those towns. He killed everyone. He killed everything inside of those walls and he left them to rot. And from there, no one ever uh, really was able to reestablish those cities in those areas. He ravaged future lands to prevent uh, future rebellions. It was large scale and long-term devastation, burning crops, like I said, burning all goods, poisoning water systems, destroying uh, agricultural fields, just basically trying to just wipe off the face of the earth all evidence of those cultures or those people who resisted the Mongols. Here are the Mongol empires around 1300 CE. In the red in the center, we have the Khanate of Chingati. Uh, the purple, the Khanate of the Golden Horde, which we'll talk about when we get to Russia a little bit. 
green is in China area, uh, and all the way up to Korea, the Khanate of the Great Khan, and then we have an orange near uh, Iraq and uh, Persia, as we had talked about before, the Ilkhanate of Persia. Then we get Kublai Khan, rules from 1264 to 1294. He's the grandson of Chinggis Khan. He uh, rules China. He was a ruthless warrior, but religiously tolerant. Uh, hosted Marco Polo, so if you know a lot about Marco Polo, uh, you'll be able to see some of his uh, kind of trade network value later on when we talk about trade. He established the Yan Dynasty to 1368. He had unsuccessful forays into Vietnam, Cambodia, Burma, Java. There were two attempted invasions of, of Japan, 1274 and 1281. They were turned back by typhoons. So these um, these Mongols got into boats and tried to invade Japan, but um, through basically the winds and the waves, uh, typhoons actually destroyed some of their boats and forced them to turn back. The Japanese have a term for this. It's known as kamikaze which is divine winds came and saved the island of Japan from invasion by the Kublai Khan. The Golden Horde. This is a group that completes their conquest of Russia between 1237 to 1241. They established a tributary relationship to the 15th century. They rule over the Crimea, which is like North Ukraine today, to the late 18th century. And there were raids into Poland, Hungary, and Germany. So they're actually pu pushing very deep into what we would call Central um, Europe during this time. And this was um, almost hearkening back to the days of the barbarians that lived uh, back during the Roman Empire's uh, height. Here's the Ilkhanate of Persia, sorry for the resolution. The Abbasid Empire gets toppled, Baghdad is sacked in 1258, 200,000 are massacred as a result, and there's an expansion into Syria checked by Egyptian forces. The Egyptians kind of push back a little bit to keep their uh, empire still strong. Mongol rule in Persia. Nomadic conquerors had learned to rule sedentary societies. Uh, one of the hardest things about being a nomadic people that actually has success militarily is learning to rule over sedentary societies. It's very easy for a group to continue to do the things that it had always done. It's very difficult to learn a new structure and a new system once you've taken over another group and understanding their way of life being completely different from yours. So these Mongols were inexperienced and they lost control of most of their lands within a hundred years. Uh, in Persia, there was a dependence on existing administration to deliver tax revenues. I want you to kind of wrap your mind around this. The Mongols did not know how to administer over a society that didn't nomadically move. So in Persia, for example, they depended that the existing peoples that they had just conquered were to be sent out to collect taxes from the people that they had conquered, and they trusted that the administration collecting these taxes would efficiently and dutifully carry out the tax collection, returning the tax revenues to the nomadic Mongols. This does not happen. Left matters of governance to bureaucracy. Again, you're the Mongols. You're still a herding uh, group, and you don't know how to govern a sedentary society with all its complexity and all its bureaucracy. So you leave all the lawmaking, all the tax uh, laws, you leave all the societal rules, the religious uh, administration, everything that has to do with like classical civilization structure that we've talked about, you leave it to a bureaucracy that's been entrenched and established for a very long time. Knowledgeable people who know exactly what they're doing, who know exactly how to play politics, how to do religious things, how to collect taxes, and you're trusting that they're going to do their job in your best interest. This again does not happen. And eventually, these Mongols get assimilated into Islamic lifestyle. Yes, the original nomadic conquerors had learned to rule uh, sedentary societies, but in a way, the conquerors became the conquered as they just became part of the original structure and life that was there before. Mongol rule in China. They strove to maintain a strict separation from the Chinese. The Mongols saw themselves as superior to the Chinese. They forbid intermarriage not to um, taint the Chinese culture, but that the Mongol uh, rule in China and the Mongol uh, society would be tainted by Chinese intermarriage. Chinese were also forbidden to study the Mongol language, again the superiority complex. They imported administrators from other areas, especially the Arabs and Persians who had become efficient at understanding bureaucracy from its long uh, lineage from classical civilizations. Yet they tolerated religious freedoms. This goes back again in many of these instances to this nomadic, multicultural pluralism of interacting with 
other cultures. The Mongols by no means saw themselves as being very progressive or seeing themselves as a group who uh, could relate to or understand other cultures. They just saw that religion wasn't a thing that they really wanted to fight over in comparison to other uh, demanding uh, things of the day. The Mongols and Buddhism. Shamanism still remains popular, but then we get to the Lamaist school of Buddhism, which is in Tibet. This gained strength among the Mongols. There's a large element of magic similar to shamanism in that it has a lot of ritual, it has a lot of magical words, it has a lot of almost um, extra spiritual structure to it. In Bo classical Buddhism, as taught by Siddhartha Gautama, you have almost a, a balanced approach to all things. You have the noble... Uh, you have the Four Noble Truths, you have the Eightfold Path, and you have a very simplified message in that you are supposed to release um, from this world so that you can move on to Nirvana and you can be free from the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. In shamanism, however, there's almost this spiritual aspect of the spirits and the world and the trees and everything is kind of uniform and binded together, and Buddhism has that built into it, but not to the extent that is taken in the Lamaist school. Integrating attitude to Mongols, the Khans are incarnations of the Buddha. So what they start to see is that uh, the, the Buddha had left this world and the Buddha had reached enlightenment. But the Khans, maybe as a result of trying to find a um, syncretism or kind of a relationship to Buddhism and the people of the Mongols, they see the Khans as incarnations of the Buddha. The Buddha coming back and he is someone who is now supposed to lead the people, not only religiously, but politically as well. This will run into Chinese, uh, especially modern day Chinese uh, authority, very hard when we start to look at that a little bit later on. Next, I have this fun little video. I love Tibetan sand mandalas. They're just really pretty. And I thought you could be able to see a little picture of this. This is a really short video. So I'll kind of narrate a little bit while you watch. So these monks are basically using a copper pipe full of sand and uh, while they move around these chalked out uh, boxes and structures, they're slowly rubbing another copper stick which has some ridges on it to let out tiny trickles of sand one bit at a time. The idea behind this for specifically Tibetan Buddhism is the impermeability of life. They could spend days, weeks, hours, depends on what, how big the mandala and what the uh, ritual is, uh, spending time trying to organize this sand into very, very, very precise locations within the mandala itself. As they uh, scratch out the mandala, it becomes more complicated. It has certain images representing certain ideals of Buddhism. And eventually what they will do uh, when they complete the mandala is actually slowly destroy the mandala in a very specific structure and by destroying the mandala it's to represent that something as beautiful as even a mandala something as beautiful as our, our lives will eventually all one day pass and so uh, I'll let you kind of finish this last little bit So we didn't actually get to see the destruction there, but uh, af basically a little bit after this, uh, the monks will go through and they will slowly destroy one symbol in each section a little bit at a time. And it will basically f uh, fan out to eight structures for to represent the uh, 
eightfold path and I just think it's kind of cool. So there you go. Got to see a little bit of a sand mandala. So the Mongols and Western integration. Experience with long distance trade. Uh, the Mongols had a lot of experience before, as we talked about on that Silk Road network uh, with long distance trade through the herding process. They also did some things like protecting the traveling merchants. There are a couple things you need to have if you're going to be traveling the Silk Roads. Number one, you're traveling through Mongol territory. You need to be protecting the goods that you have. And number two, you need to also know where you're going. The Mongols were very good at knowing the routes, the structures, the places in the land where you could actually make it through certain areas with uh, safely with your goods. Volume of trade increases across Central Asia. Uh, as a result of this, diplomatic missions are protected by the Mongols. Missionary activity increases the spread of Buddhism and Islam in those areas. And Mongol resettlement policies. Mongol resettlement policies were basically the Mongols taking a lot of skilled artisans and a lot of craftsmen and educated individuals into their ranks and resettling them closer nearby uh, the Mongol uh, cities that were starting to pop up small scale cities and also taking them with them uh, to do administration and also to provide tools and weapons and anything that those craftsmen and artisans were really uh, good at. The decline of the Mongol Empire in Persia, overspending, poor tax returns from overburdened peasantry, the Ilkhan attempts to replace precious metal currency with paper in the 1290s, there was a failure, it was forced to rescind. Now, you have to think back to a time when uh, people really liked having the ability to know what things were worth. If you had a precious metal currency, you knew how hard it was to get gold out of the ground. You couldn't just forge gold out of the ground. People kind of knew the weight. They knew the value of those things. One gold coin or one silver coin or one copper coin, whatever, takes a lot of work to, for to forge in a uh, structure and put stamps on it and make sure that it's what it is and it has purity to it. So this ensured good trade as a result of um, having that structure. But the Ilkhan changes over to paper currency, which paper is much more easily forged. It's much more uh, easily uh, kind of counterfeited as it is with today. We still have problems with counterfeiting and currency around the world. And there, it's a failure because people do not really want to trade with paper. They want to be able to have that security, especially at this time with that precious metal currency. And it's forced to rescind and kind of go back to the old metal currency. There was factional fighting. And the last Ilkhan, he dies without an heir in 1335, and Mongol rule collapses in Persia. We then get to the decline of the Yuan Dynasty in China. The Mongols spend bullion that supported paper currency, and public loss loses confidence in paper money. Prices rise as a result. Uh, basically, the way it works is when you switch over to a paper currency, you're supposed to have in reserve somewhere safe, like in a giant bank or a vault or something protected by guards, a bunch of bullion or precious metals that back up that paper currency. Paper is more efficient at trading. It's less heavy. You can hide it better. It doesn't make take a lot of weight on your cart. You just basically give somebody thin pieces of paper. They give you goods and everybody's happy. But what you have to do is you have to protect the original value of that currency by having it stored somewhere. In um, the uh, in America today, we have paper currency. And back in the day, we had the gold standard, where we actually had a piece of gold or a certain amount of gold that backed up every dollar that was spent in the United States. So if we really wanted to, we could go through the process back in the day, not today, where you take your money and you go and exchange that for gold, and then you could have that gold currency, which shows the value originally of something. We don't do that now today, but that's pretty much what they did back then. But the problem was in Yuan Dynasty was that the Mongols spent the bullion that was supposed to support the paper currency. The public finds this out. They don't have any confidence that the paper money's worth anything, and prices rise, meaning that they're going to say a uh, bag of rice originally was one uh, piece of paper money. Now it's 1,000 pieces of paper money because they don't know if when they turn in those 1,000 pieces of paper money, if they'll get any bullion in exchange for those people that really want the... Uh, the value of that bullion from there. From the 1320s, there's major power struggles. The bubonic plague actually spreads in 1330 and 1340s, and by 1368, the Mongols flee a uh, peasant rebellion. The peasants had pretty much had enough in the Yuan Dynasty in China. 
The surviving Mongol Khanates, the Khanate of Chingadi in Central Asia, was a continued threat to China. The Golden Horde in the Caucasus and the steppes to the mid-16th century, or the way to the about 1550s, and a continued threat to Russia. Tamerlane the Conqueror, around 1336-1405, Turkish conqueror Timur, Timur the Lame, or Tamerlane, uh, united the Turkish nomads in the Khanate of Chingati, the major military campaigns. He built a capital at Samarkand. Here's Tamerlane's empire. It's all in purple. It's one of the larger uh, empires that we're studying for this region. He's able to really consolidate a lot of power under himself after the fall of some of these other um, Khanates from before. Tamerlane's heir, again, poor organization of governing structure leads to his downfall. Power struggles divide the empire into four. Uh, I want you to think back. We can start doing some more comparing and contrasting to some divisions of empires into fours. Uh, it was yet heavily influenced several empires as a long-term consequence, the Mughal, the Safavid, and the Ottoman. I know a while back we actually had an essay on these three empires and some of their um, compare and contrast and some of the things that they had in common. Uh, so this is one of those uh, key structures is Tamerlane's uh, long-term uh, influence and in his uh, administrative structure and such through the Mughal, Safavid, and Ottomans. Next, we're going to talk about the Ottoman Empire. Osman, charismatic leader who dominates the part of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey again. He declares independence from the Saljuk Sultan in 1299. He attacks the Byzantine Empire. His followers are known as Asmanlis, or Ottomans. The Ottoman conquests. By the 1350s, they can uh, have a conquest in the Balkans. Local support for the Ottoman invasions. Peasants were unhappy with the fragmented, ineffective Byzantine rule. There's a term that's used today called Byzantine, and it's supposed to represent a chaotic or archaic or unstructured kind of way of doing something. Uh, so if, for example, you're forced to learn AP World History, but imagine your teacher only made you learn it in Latin, that would be considered Byzantine. It would be considered old-fashioned. It would be considered kind of crazy, outdated, out of unstructured. And that's where this kind of comes from, this fragmented and ineffective Byzantine rule. Tamerlane defeats Ottoman forces in 1402, but the Ottomans do recover by the 1440s. Next, we get the capture of Constantinople in 1453, one of the biggest turning points in world history, the possible complete fall of the Roman Empire by 1453. Sultan Mehmed II becomes known eventually as Mehmed the Conqueror, uh, besieges the city of Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, he uh, takes over Constantinople, and he changes that name from Constantinople, which was a Roman name, to Istanbul, and it becomes his new capital. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little more later, but it becomes a huge event in world history as a result of the shift from a purely Christian Christian uh, Europe to now an encroaching force of Muslims into what is we would call uh, the Roman Empire. We've made it. When you finish studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Number one, explain the social and economic factors of Eurasian nomadic pastoralist civilizations. Number two, compare and contrast the Turkish empires of Persian, Anatolia, and India. That's probably like a three-circle Venn diagram. Number three, explain the origins, course, and legacy of Chinggis Khan's Mongol Empire. What did he do? Why was he awesome? Why was he not awesome? Number four, identify and discuss the key features of the Mongol empires after Chinggis Khan. What happened to those Mongol empires after him? Number five, explain the importance of the Mongols in Eurasian integration. Number six, understand the reasons behind the decline of Mongols in Persia and China. Similar things. Number seven, identify key nomadic peoples and leaders in Eurasia after the Mongol era. One really big one comes to mind. And number eight, explain the foundation of the Ottoman Empire. Here's your writing assignment. Write a short response, five to eight sentences to the following question using specific examples from the textbooks and be prepared to discuss them in class. Number one, why do you think the nomadic peoples of Asia were so successful and influential during this period? What was different from earlier centuries? What were the limits of their success? Number two, what do you think was the most significant legacies of this period of nomadic empires? How did these people change history? Very big part of history, especially these nomadic peoples that came from kind of a random part of the world compared to what we've been studying up to previously. And number three, Marco Polo's account of his travels in the 13th century has long been one of the most widely read and beloved sources in history. Why is this? Why is this source so valuable? Why was and is it still so popular? Uh, to answer this, you probably should look really deeply into your textbook, look at some of the accounts from Marco Polo, see what kind of uh, makes this source valuable to our understanding of Asia and Central Asia in general. 
as always, it's been great talking to you. Uh, I hope you're able to get a chance to reread. Uh, this has been Chapter 17. Uh, I'd like to say thank you, and I'll see you soon. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back. Loud. Loud.